So what we're going to talk about in this session is reluctant writers. We're going to talk about all the kids we teach, but then talk about how certain skills and activities can turn into skill builders for our History Day students. And quite frankly, I think good writing instruction for all our students. I love to teach writing. It's actually probably my favorite skill set to teach. And it's why I love History Day, because all History Day students are writers. So I want to give some specific things to think about when you're working with your students who may or may not love to write. And let's be honest, there's days where we love to write, there's days where we hate to write. First thing I think is important, whenever possible, give students choice. So we're doing five exercises here. I'm giving you the topic of one of them. You're going to create the topics of the other one. That's intentional. If you choose what you're writing about, you're more apt to be interested in what you're writing about. And for the circles, I decided to bring uh, my home of Philadelphia here while I come visit Albuquerque, New Mexico. The second rule of writing, and I want you to enforce this in your class, because as soon as you say we're going to write something in class, what do your students say? No. Oh, what's the second thing they say? I can't say that. <laughs> <laughs> what else do they say? Seriously, you hear them. No. Do we? Do we have to? How? How long? How many sentences do I have to write? Do I have to fill the page? Do I have to write in cursive? Right? You hear these things? I'm not the only one who heard these in my classroom. So rule number one, ignore your students whining about writing. It's their job to whine. It's your job to say, I don't care. And honestly, make a joke out of it. Whine back at them. I actually find that kind of fun. I think everybody has this kid in their classroom, right? They might be bigger, they might be smaller, but they look like this kid who doesn't want to write, and honestly, I think it's a skill that we have to practice. It's like anything. If we don't do something all the time, we're not very good at it. So if you only have your students write a final exam essay, they're going to be pretty terrible to grade. But we have, it's a skill, and we have to practice it regularly. And I think there's kind of two types of struggling writers. The first type are the ones who don't know where to start, right? Who blank out and sit there with the blank paper and stare at you or give you dirty looks or do anything, or go to the bathroom for 25 minutes. I think the other type, and I think some of you, from meeting some of you earlier, might be working with some of these gifted and talented writers. And these writers can have their own challenges. Many of them tend to be super perfectionists. And writing is scary because writing is hard. We did an example in the, in the first session, and when I asked people to share, about a third of the group apologized before they shared what they wrote. We don't want to do that. Writing is a process, and we've got to understand that it's not going to be perfect on the first try, and that's okay. Because nothing you do in life is perfect the first time around. Those of you who teach 12-year-olds see that every single day. So I'm going to give 10 strategies that I like to do when I work with students. And we're going to exercise out five of them. First thing I love to do was establish a writer's notebook. And i got to be honest, the first time I heard this from another teacher, I was like, that's dumb. I'm not doing that, it's social studies. And then I tried it and I saw what it did for my students. So I would go out in the summertime when they're dirt cheap and buy like 100 or 200 at a time. When I could get them for like 25 cents. I used to send family members when there were limits to buy the 10 at the minimum price. You know how to do this. And I said that the notebooks were mine. Each student had them, they had their name on them. And they were allowed to use and they used them throughout the year. And I use them for writing exercises, and I also use them for test essays. I didn't have to deal with lots of loose paper. I knew exactly who it came from, what it did. And I found this really important. It was best because it showed growth. What I used to do, when we'd get to the midterm, I'd tell my students, go back and read the first essay you wrote. Look at how much you've improved. And this is an easy way to show and demonstrate that improvement. It's also great when you're going into a parent conference to be able to show the writing and the exercises and the ways that we're trying to improve. All right, the second tip I have is to write every day. Make sure your students are writing in class, at home, every day. Now, I know you're looking at me going, what kind of crazy is she? Does she forget? She's only been out of the classroom five years and she thinks I have time to write every day. Because we assume sometimes that if the students are writing, that we need to do what? Grade it. Eh, sorry, no. That is not possible. While I absolutely agree that your students need to write every day, you cannot possibly grade every day. And I believe in the intermittent grading method. And I'm going to explain why I believe in this method. And the reason is I had 
Thank you, Hannah. A heck of a high school Spanish teacher. She graded when she felt like it. She collected homework sometimes. One week, it might be four days in a row. Then not again for two weeks. Man, we were terrified of her. Because you never knew what was coming. And you always had to be on your toes. And she was no dummy. When she looked around and realized not a lot of people had something done, you better believe she collected it that day. And that kept us on our toes. And I think that that was really powerful and really important. And I think that's what we've got to do with writing, is keep our students on their toes. Now, sometimes you do want to collect and read everyone's. That's like a test. Sometimes you want to rotate through who you collect. So sometimes you might do a writing exercise and say, you know what, I'm going to take 10 tonight. I'll take volunteers. Sometimes you might work through the class. So you might take five in the first activity, and then a couple days later you'll take another five. As long as you work through your class in the space of a grading period, then everybody can get a grade. You can grade a manageable number on which you can actually give good feedback. And students never quite know, so they're always going to take you seriously. And I would always remind my students, I have the right to choose you to collect. Which means, if we're doing a writing exercise, and you're sitting here drawing smiley faces, you better believe that you're on my collection list for that day. So that encourages them to keep at it, even on days when they don't want to. Now, my third strategy is write in different ways. When we say write, our students assume we're asking for what? Five paragraph, essays. Five paragraph essays. Is there a place for that? Yes. Is that reasonable every day or every week? Heck no. But have them write differently. Sometimes it might just be a couple sentences. That's writing for the day. Sometimes it's making a list or an outline. That's okay. Sometimes we might be using graphic organizers. There's no one right way, and I think that sometimes that's the harder part of writing than actually constructing the paragraph, and help it, have your students write in that way. Now, I thought what we would do, we're going to use one of our exercises here, and yes, I'm going to have you write a little bit, I'm going to have you share with your neighbor, which is not only, because I think your writing always has to have an audience. So for the triangle, for those of you who came in late, you talked about a location that you study, so some time and place in history. So for the first writing task, we're going to do it for about a minute. I'm going to ask you to imagine you are in the location that you established in your triangle. Use each of your five senses. This can be fun. What do you see? What do you smell? Hear, taste, and touch. One minute. Do it. Go. Oh, I see a lot of reluctant writers in the room. <laughs> These are the biggest reluctant writers. Do you want to add the historical time? Or? It can be historical, it can be modern, whatever you teach. Something that's relevant to your curriculum. Right, but I mean, like, do you want us, if it's in the past, just write what we would have saw during that? Yeah, during that time. So, I'm at the Gates of the Bastille, 1789. That's a fun one. Okay, wherever you're at, finish your sentence. And just look up when you're done. Okay, share with your neighbor, what was your location? And why might you want to do an activity like this in your class? Go. Okay, share back with me. Give me three reasons why we might want to use descriptive writing in class. No, we're still describing. Well, give me one reason we might want to use descriptive writing in class. It's an entry point, right? It's not as quite so scary, because we all kind of understand, see, smell, hear, taste, and touch. It's an entry point. Good. Why else? Why else would you use descriptive writing in your class? Why else? Because you get the details. Mm-hmm. You get a sense of what the students are thinking it would have been like. And that can lead to some really interesting discussions. That can lead to some writing assignments. That can also lead to kind of sometimes helping to understand misconceptions or misunderstandings. One of my classic moments as a teacher was the time I got an essay about ancient Mesopotamia where the student talked about flying around on an airplane. <laughs> and I'm going, like, I'm pulling my hair. Like, is this kid in my class for the last six months? I go to the special ed co-teacher. I'm like, what am I missing? Because I'm clear. And she goes, oh, I know what it is. 
You told them that Mesopotamia was built on a plane. P-L-A-I-N. And this lovely seventh grade girl thought they were flying around with the ancient ziggurats and the Code of Hammurabi. But you know what I mean? If I had done a simple exercise like that and walked around and looked over her shoulder, I could have been like, oh, wrong plane. Let's fix that now. Give me one other reason you might want to use descriptive writing. Perspective. Perspective, why? So it forces them to not just think about the factual information in kind of a memorization type of uh, presentation, but it, it lets them look at things from the human perspective mm -hmm. and understand that history in a more intimate way. History is people. We have to keep reminding our kids because they think that people in history are somehow not like us, and they're an awful lot more like us than we'd probably like to admit. So that's kind of one way. Think about this for paper writers. Paper writers who need to describe and need to get at the core. Little short writing exercises like this can really improve the way that they describe. And this might be a differentiation thing. Maybe on the first exercise that we do, I'm going to collect my paper writers and give them feedback. Maybe on the next one, I'm going to collect my website authors because there's different styles of writing and different exercises that will help them. All right, let's go to another one. For my fourth tip is use practical writing formats. I do a lot of writing for my job. I very rarely write a five paragraph essay. But it's very possible to write things like a resume for a historical figure. Uh, have, the, have students start tweeting as historical characters. That actually can be an awful lot of fun. Have them write a song. Have them write a blog. Because guess what? They think it's fun and it's still writing. And the more different formats we throw at them, the better. I'm going to throw out one of my favorites. This is something I actually did as an online discussion forum, but we're just going to do it verbally. Next to the circle, I've given you a topic from a review activity on colonial America. Some of you have real people, so you might be George Washington or Abigail Adams or Alexander Hamilton. Some of you are composite or compiled people. So you might be a southern planter, you might be an indentured servant, you might be a blacksmith in a particular area. Some of you are inanimate objects. Some of you are colonies. Uh, the Atlantic Ocean is in the room because that's one of my favorite ones. I'd like you to now assume that character and turn to your neighbor. It's 1776. How's it going? Have a conversation from that point of view. Go. All right, you, some tips if you really want to have fun with this. This is one of my favorite writing activities of all time. I have about 60 of these for Colonial America, and that's in the files of stuff I'm going to share out. If you want to steal the idea, run with it. Assign the students out so everybody gets one of these at the end of the unit. And again, for the first one, like you might need to take some of the trickier ones, like the Atlantic Ocean, and assign it to a student who thinks a little more outside the box for the first one to get it going. Put them in an online discussion thread. Your first post is you've got to post as this person. It's essentially a one paragraph review of what you've been talking about throughout this unit, right? But then the second part is they have to respond to each other. And while students, you have to remind them to be appropriate, you can get some really neat threads going between the merchants and the planners or a loyalist and a revolutionary. And it's very interesting to see the kids who get a little outside the box what I found is that when I took this discussion online, students who would not open their mouth in my classroom would be the most interesting writers because they would really get into this. And some kids will write more online than they'll ever say out loud in class. And again, it's still writing and it's a different forum. And when it's done, that discussion thread is one giant review document for the whole class to read and access. And if you really want to mess with them, have them write for kids they don't know. If you have three classes, split them up. So one third of you, you're on board A, and then you're on board B, and you're on board C. And other kids will be on that board. So now you have an audience of other kids you don't know. A lot of kids will up their writing because they don't know who they're trying to impress. Or that might be that girl in that other class that they're trying to impress. Whatever. It works. And it gets them writing. Obviously, this one is all about what? Helping to see historical point of view or perspective, absolutely. And think about different points of view. Another way to approach this is looking from the same event 
but asking one student or group, you know, you're going to look at the American Revolution from a military point of view. You're going to look at it from an economic. You're going to look at it from a political, social, artistic, to help students see that one event can be seen very differently by different groups of people and different groups of historians. And again, these are things that you can easily adapt up or adapt down for older or younger learners. All right, I think this helps all History Day kids understand perspective and point of view. If you have students who are struggling to see the other point of view, who are struggling, especially if they're caught up in that good versus evil, and they can't look at the other side because they were wrong, assign them a wrong point of view. Help them understand that you don't have to agree with it, but you have to understand why people believed it. Because you can't argue against something that you don't fully understand. I think that's something we need far more of in this country. All right, fifth tip. Writing has to be both short-term and long-term. Sometimes a writing exercise is just like we did the first one. It's five minutes and it's a few sentences and that's all we're looking for to get discussion going. Sometimes we need to work on something over the course of five or six days. So maybe we start on the first day and get topic sentences down. And then we go to the second day and we build out a list of what our evidence is going to be. Then maybe on the third and the fourth day we're writing that paragraph. And then maybe on day five you switch with your partner in peer review and on day six you're turning in a final paragraph. Because students need to see that writing is a process. All right, six is my favorite tip and it messes with kids so badly and I love it. Take away their pencils and force them to write in pen. I am taught in a school district where my kids were taught that they could not cross out in pen by the elementary school teachers. I don't know why they taught them that. They were so afraid, I think, of having it neat. But what that meant is a kid would write a word and then they'd erase it and they'd write it again. And it would be three or four times to get them through one sentence. And I said, no, you have to write. Just cross out and keep going. It's also important that I be able to see your cross outs because you might have been on the right track and then you double guessed yourself and got off it, but I can't see that to give you that feedback to say, no, 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 this was the right answer. Go with this, go with your gut. That's something that my students, and I, I also made them do it because you had to write with pen on the AP exam and they were so afraid to write with pen and I had to get them over that fear. But that's something I think it changes the way that you write and it helps the teacher see their flow. All right, so we're going to do a little demo on. Don't be afraid to bring in a little creativity. Mixing it up a little bit in a class can have a lot of fun. Um, bring in historical fiction accounts. I like doing historical dialogue. Have two people from a time period have to have a discussion with each other. And you can do this on paper, you can do this on an online thread, you can do this out loud in class. I think when you do a lot of creative writing things, it helps to put a time limit. I love that online countdown timer. Put it in the front of the room. Okay, we have 10 minutes, and at the end of the 10 minutes, I'm taking whatever you have. That forces students to get started and to get over that hurdle of, well, I don't know, and why don't I just sit and look at you for a minute, and maybe we can decide what we're going to do. What I thought we would do, I'm a fan of Hamilton. I like musical theater. So I like the quote that says, legacy, what's a legacy? It's planting seeds in a garden you never get to see. So for our writing exercise, I'm going to ask you to take the star. The star is the person in history with whom you identify, character who you think is interesting. And I'm going to tell you that your historical figure has 60 seconds to define his or her legacy. Make me believe you and give specific evidence to support your argument. I'm going to let you talk through this one with a partner. How do you defend the legacy of the historical figure that you admire? Go for it. Talk through this one, what would you do? All right, so here's my question, big picture. An activity like this, whether you did it in written form, whether you did it using like Flipgrid, where the students all recorded their 60 seconds and posted up and could comment, whether you chose to do it um, out loud in class, how could this help our performance students? Or how could this help conclusion writing? So what? It's the so what, right? Why do you matter in history? And again, this is another great review activity because you can pull people from all across. Defend why they matter. Define, defend why this person or this event matters. Because at the end of the day, the key to this writing assignment is 60 seconds. It's important that we be able to make our case quickly and succinctly, and it has to have evidence to support it. Because if I say this person is important, 
but I can't show why, then they're just cool. And there's a difference between cool and important. All right, my other favorite. Write more or write less. This one's going to be independent, and I am going to make you write this because it's evil and it's fun. You ready? So I'd like you to take your arrow. The most interesting question that's been asked in your class in the last unit. So something a student asked you that you went, oh, that's a good question. I want you to try to answer that question in 25 words or fewer. And actually count them up. How would you answer that question? All right, who wants to be brave enough to share? What's the question and what's your short answer? I'll go. go for it. So one of my students, we just finished the um, Constitution, all that business, and the, the kids were upset with the Declaration of Independence. And one of the students asked, well, why didn't they just kill the king? Ooh. Like, why didn't they just, they just kill George III? Kill George okay, interesting question. What's your answer? So 25 put, or less? Um, killing the king was a direct act of treason punishable by death, and the British Navy would retaliate immediately. Good. Give me another question and answer. Give me another one. Go ahead, Ellen. Um, so this is just one that comes up a lot, uh, is, you know, is it important to separate, you know, when you're talking about great men in history who maybe were very bad people, especially by modern standards, how, how can you present that mm -hmm. as a clear picture? Like, do you always have to mention that Henry Ford was an anti-Semite when, you, when you're doing a project on him? Um, and I don't know whether my answer is right, but it's under 25 words. All right. <laughs> don't apologize before we share writing. I talked about that. Go um, ahead. Give it a shot. When you're looking at the impact of a great man, a quote unquote great man's work, it can be useful to separate specific outcomes from his personality. Okay. Give me one more to share. Go ahead. Um, so my students are asking why Jefferson owned slaves if he was for equal rights for all men. So because he wasn't. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that was an opinion that just came out. It happens sometimes. Go ahead. So um, I just put Jefferson recognized slavery as a malicious institution, but knew banning it outright would divide and possibly destroy the nation. And would bankrupt himself, but yes. he was practical <laughs> enough to know that. So. Now here's a neat activity. Have students write something in 25 words, and then have them try to rewrite it in 10 or 12. Oftentimes what we find, especially when we talk about word limits, we're trying to get students to tighten their writing. The number one suggestion I give for tightening writing, if you're tight on that word count, go back and look at verbs. Oftentimes, we write with passive verbs and passive voice all the time because we speak that way. Oftentimes, when you can get words out that are like is, was, were, has, been, 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 and you can replace them with past tense active verbs, your writing sounds better, reads better, and is far fewer words. Use that trick as you're helping students get under that word count. Because honestly, just have them go through and just highlight all your verbs. Sometimes they need help knowing what the verb is, but if they need that, you help them. And go, oh, can you replace any of these? Do we really need six words to say Jefferson stated? Because oftentimes that's an easy fix. Uh, obviously, this is a huge help for your paper students and your website students and your, especially those exhibit students. I think exhibits are the easiest project to finish and the hardest to do well. And I think it's because of those student word count and they really have to think. And I think they have in some ways the hardest writing challenge of any of the five categories. And keep that in mind, you know, remind them of that, that it takes a lot of work to get down to those 500 words. All right, number nine, I love using visuals as prompts. I probably have a ton of time to sort of do some plugs here, but use a visual, project it up, let them choose it or you choose it, and just ask a simple question, so what? Talk with your neighbor. How could you use a visual? This is a little hard to see with the sunshine here, but the sinking of the U-175 by a U.S. Coast Guard ship off the coast of Normandy. So what? Why does this picture matter? Turn to your neighbor. Go. How could a, you could use this as a writing prompt? Here's my tip on this. If your students are building an exhibit or building a website and they're going to put a picture in or a collection, maybe a series of three pictures, if it's important enough to have a picture, 
You have to analyze it. You can't just tell me what this is. This is a Coast Guard ship and it's firing on another ship on June 6th. It's true, it's accurate, but why does it matter? It matters because we've got to connect it back to our argument. It matters because I've got a thesis that shows the role of the Coast Guard in the Normandy invasion. It matters because I'm looking at specific military tactics. It matters because I'm telling the story of this ship and its role in the invasion. And that's the analysis statement that has to go at the bottom of the pictures. If not, it's just an illustration. And oftentimes what separates good History Day projects from really good History Day projects is that last step. As opposed to, it says on the website, students like to put like 25 pictures on a page, right? And they're all accurate, they all go with the event. But they miss the step of explaining why these images matter. And that little bit of analysis, and again, these are short. This might be two sentences. That's what drives you from a good project to a really good project. All right, my last big tip. Don't let grammar take over writing. And you're not supposed to say grammar Nazi, but it's funny. Um, I use this technique called focus correction areas. Work on one or two skills at a time. So for example, it drives me crazy when people do not capitalize properly. And I would always start in the first unit with my students. We're going to focus on proper capitalization. What gets a capital letter and what doesn't. And then when you turn in your writing piece at the end of the first unit, our focus correction area, and I'm telling you this up front, is capitalization. You get your grade on your work. And then if you get your capitalization right, you get plus one point or plus two points. If you do it right most of the time, pretty good, grade stays. If you bomb it because you write everything in lowercase letters, including the first letter of every sentence, you get minus two. Now, we all know that a plus one or a plus two doesn't really make a darn bit of difference in the grade. But all the students, students have that one little incentive to get a bonus point. So they're going to focus on that. And you'd be surprised how quickly they can pick up the skill you've been practicing. Then on the next one, go to something else. And what that something else is depends on your group of writers. Maybe your group needs to focus on subject-verb agreement, or your group needs to focus on possessives, or your group needs to focus, whatever that skill is, whatever's driving you crazy when you grade, make that your focus correction area for the next time. Then, as you're grading, you don't need to try to worry about every little picky and little thing. You can focus on one thing, get your students to master it, and move on to the next thing. All right, my last two tips, share mistakes and share triumphs. You've got to share student writing out. So when I was teaching my students to write thesis statements uh, for, for essays for tests, I would start by sharing some the next Monday in class. And I would share some that were really good, and I would share some that were really terrible. And I would tell, I'd type them into a PowerPoint slide so they didn't, there's no handwriting involved. And I would tell the students, I'm like, look, you can identify yourself if you want when I, if I put your name up there. And if you don't want to, nobody needs to know. The only person who knows that was yours is you and me. And I'd say, look, expect that at some point in the year, your writing is going to be up here for us to work on. What I actually found is that students were clamoring to admit when it was their writing especially when it was bad. And you know what though? That's good. Because then I would say, you know, I'd put a, a thesis up and somebody would go, oh yeah, that was mine and that really, I really blew that one, didn't I? And I'd say, okay, how do we make this person's thesis better? When you create that culture where they're willing to fess up, they're more willing to be open to taking the criticism and learning that it's a process. Also share really good things. I also I used to keep a list of what I called AP funnies, like really funny things that kids put in the essay that weren't necessarily right, like the Bank of the United States is not Bank of America, or um, Franklin and Theodore Roosevelt, two different people, not the same. My big suggestion for you, I've given you 10 ideas today. Take one thing back and try it this week. I think sometimes when people give recommendations in education, there's some kind of expectation that you're going to totally overhaul and change everything you've been doing for 20 years. That's ridiculous. But think about one thing that resonated with you or that you think your students would like and give it a shot. You might be surprised what it does. And don't be afraid to try. Because, you know, yes, your students are going to whine when you say we're going to write every day this week. 
That's okay, they'll like it by Friday. All right, before I get to a few shameless plugs, questions on writing strategies. And we can totally turn the camera up because then I do the ask me anything that won't get me fired. But we can't have that on video. All right, couple plugs. Uh, if you didn't get a copy of the hair story book, that's the new one I edited. I love it. I'm a little partial, I'm not gonna lie. Uh, 20 bell ringers written by teachers for teachers on women in American history. So if you teach American history, it's cool and it's fun. Uh, and there's, everything is also available electronically. So if you want to get the document to use it in different forms, it's all on the website. Uh, I want to show you a couple cool things that you might find interesting. Who teaches World War I here? One person? Seriously, that's a couple people. Okay. Uh, we've been doing a lot of work with the U.S. World War I Centennial Commission over the last couple years. And we've got a landing page, nhg.org slash WWI, or it stretches out to World War I. We've been running a webinar series that Angela's stuck in this year. Um, you can tell me how much you don't like it later. You can tell them later. But what's kind of cool about this, so we did a lecture last month with Jennifer Keene, who's a professor at Chapman University on the World War I veteran experience. So you had to be in the class to join it live. But the next day, we post it, and anybody can watch it. So it's a way to kind of get to some really cool professors doing some neat work. Um, it also might be helpful to to use with some of your students if they're looking at a World War I topic. We also have on this page uh, some silent heroes and veteran stories, some World War I lesson plans. Right now, there's about 20 lesson plans up there, and we're going to be adding 17 more in the next month. So if you need World War I stuff, come check this out. It's kind of cool. Um, I'll also do a shameless plug. The World War II folks teaching in here. Uh, we've been working for the last few years with the American Battle Monuments Commission. And they are the people who take care of the U.S. military cemeteries overseas. I've been to all the military cemeteries overseas except for like two at this point, which is kind of crazy. Uh, but we have all kinds of stories about fallen heroes here from World War I. We actually we have World War I, World War II, and Korea in the collection now. If you're looking for a Veterans Day activity, there's all kinds of neat things. Because you can click on each person. You've got some basic information, a story. You have all kinds of primary sources that you can blow up. And since we've traveled, we have eulogies that our teachers have given all around the world that are getting posted up there. That's what I've got for you. I want to say thank you. It's a beautiful day. I appreciate the time and the energy that you've taken. Um, I'm loving Albuquerque. I'm excited to hopefully come back next time in the winter time when it's not because when it's really, really cold where I am. I want to turn things over to Ellen to wrap the day, but if you have questions, I'm happy to stick around and answer them before you head out today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right.